Hi, and welcome back. Thank you for continuing our conversation about immunity. Today, we're gonna to talk in our second video about diseases of the immune system, about hypersensitivities. In other words, these are cases in which the immune system works too well. In fact, the immune system in some of these cases reacts to our own bodies. And this is what's referred to as an autoimmunity. So stay tuned while we continue our conversation about diseases of the immune system with hypersensitivities. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today, as I mentioned in the intro, we're going to be talking about hypersensitivities, which are the other type of immune system diseases, contrasting that with hyposensitivities, which we talked about in another video. So there are four different types of hypersensitivities, and the different types of hypersensitivities are going to involve different cell types, different antibody classes, and present differently uh, depending on how they're going to be caused. So we'll start by talking about type one hypersensitivities. These are also referred to as immediate reactions. And they're referred to immediate reactions because they typically, they typically occur within minutes of being exposed to their particular antigen that's going to trigger them. So type one hypersensitivities are going to involve uh, a type of antibody called the IgE antibody. Now, if you recall, IgE antibodies are those that are able to bind to specialized receptors on some of our granulocytes. Most specifically, mast cells and basal fills are going to be the culprits in most of the cases with type 1 hypersensitivities, although eosinophils are also involved. All three of these granulocytes are packed full of inflammatory cytokines, and they have that specialized IgE receptor that allows them to bind to IgE antibodies. So what typically happens in the case of a type 1 hypersensitivity, which we'll learn in just a few minutes, is basically what we think about when we think about an allergy, also known as an atopy. So what happens the first time an individual is exposed to a given antigen, their body is going to mount an immune response against it. Now, what happens in the case of individuals who develop an allergy or a type 1 hypersensitivity, rather than making IgG antibodies and reacting weakly to that particular substance, they're going to respond strongly and have a production of IgE antibodies. This is what's referred to as the sensitizing dose. So typically the first exposure to what we'll now refer to as an allergen is going to be referred to as the sensitizing dose because it's needed to form that immunological memory. Now the thing to remember is this, IgE antibodies can then, can then be secreted throughout the body. Their constant region will bind to those surface receptors on the outside of mast cells, for example, and they will remain in the tissue for a very, very long time. Then when that allergen is reintroduced into the body, uh, those IgE antibodies will be bound to their particular cognate antigen, the allergen in this case, and that will trigger degranulation of the mast cells and localized, in some cases, or systemic inflammation. So as you can guess, the, the severity of an atopic allergy can, can range from the simple uh, sort of headaches or itching or sneezing and wheezing all the way up through anaphylaxis. So these are both considered to be atopies as well as, uh, as, well as anaphylaxis are referred to as type 1 hypersensitivities, again, which we commonly think of as allergies. So one of the things that we've actually noticed when it comes to type 1 hypersensitivities is they seem to be on the rise, particularly in developed countries. And there's, there's actually been uh, a good deal of thought that's gone into why this may be the case. The current model for why we believe we're seeing this uptick in these in allergies such as food allergies and drug allergies uh, in, in developed countries such as the United States is called the hygiene hypothesis. And the way to think about it is this. We have these highly tuned rock star immune systems that can respond to millions and millions of different things that come into our body. But because in developed countries, our lives are lived mainly in a very clean way, this immune system is unable to be trained to distinguish in some cases between what's truly a problem and what's not. And in response, their body's actually going to mount an immune response to things that aren't necessarily pathogenic. So in many cases, it could be something like peanut antigen or trina antigen or shellfish antigen, or in my case, I have an allergy, bee venom. My body responds quite strongly and I have to carry an EpiPen. Uh, as a result, if I get stung by a bee, my body, really, that bee venom binds to IgA antibodies on the surface of my mast cells, they degranulate and there's a potential for me to go into anaphylactic shock. So I am a type one hypersensitivity patient. Now, what we know about atopies, and again, 
not all of them are that serious. Um, when we talk about atopic allergies, we're also talking about things such as hay fever, uh, so seasonal allergies. Somewhere between 10 and 30% of the population has an atopy, although that may actually be uh, an underestimation. The main reason why is the bulk of type 1 hypersensitivities really can be solved by OTC meds. They're not particularly serious. So, for example, if you're someone that suffers from seasonal allergies, well, in that case, you, you probably can solve that through over-the-counter antihistamines and other drugs uh, that will prevent you from having signs and symptoms. Other ones are obviously reported things that cause people to go under, uh, go into anaphylactic shock, such as certain food allergies or allergies to bee venom or certain drug allergies where they need to avoid the drug. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about type 1 hypersensitivities is there does seem to be a fairly strong genetic component as to why some people might be more susceptible to developing allergies, whereas others don't. And I can give you another example from my own life. I have two children, a son and a daughter, and my son actually has a very severe allergy to peanuts and tree nuts. Um, he was born first, he's the oldest, and what's interesting is we discovered this, and then subsequently we had my daughter a few years later. And his allergist said, by the way, you should be aware that because your son has an allergy, this very like there's a 30% chance now instead of a 2% chance that your daughter might have a food allergy as well. So lo and behold, we actually got her tested and early on in life, she was uh, allergic to both dairy and egg, which is very, very common for young children. My son at the time had a peanut and trina allergy as well as an egg allergy. So what's very interesting about this and what we've noticed about allergies in general is that they're kind of mysterious. Some allergies develop later in life. So for example, I had a great grandmother who developed a shellfish allergy late in her 80s. Other ones will go away. So for example, you can outgrow some of your allergies. My daughter outgrew both her egg and her dairy allergy. My son outgrew his, his egg allergy. On the other hand, he will probably never outgrow his, al his peanut allergy nor his trina allergy. What that means is that some, in some cases, allergies are lifelong phenomena. So this is something that's very, uh, something we don't understand very well, but it needs to be, you need to be aware of this with allergies that sometimes you can outgrow them. Sometimes they'll appear later in life and you can become allergic to things that you were never allergic to before. And other times uh, they are things that will be a lifelong thing that you'll be born with and you'll likely die with, not from hopefully. So as I mentioned before, individuals who have a type one hypersensitivity are individuals who will produce IgE antibodies instead of IgG antibodies. These IgE antibodies uh, towards their allergen will then coat the surface of granulocytes such as mast cells or basophils. And then when they're re-exposed to their particular allergen, this will cause the degranulation of these cells leading to the release of inflammatory cytokines. These include cytokines such as histamines, bradykinin, leukotriene, serotonin, and prostaglandins. All of these have the ability to somehow uh, affect the vasculature. In other words, they're gonna cause vasodilation. They can also cause bronchoconstriction. They can also cause, uh, this is what also causes the, the wheezing and the, the, the the, the flow of mucus and the tears and stuff that are all in the itching that's associated with uh, different types of allergies. So let's look at some examples of what we can, of type one hypersensitivities, and you'll be able to see that some of them are, are quite benign, whereas others are highly problematic. So one of the most common examples of a type one hypersensitivity is hay fever. So hay fever is what happens when, uh, also known as uh, allergic rhinitis uh, or seasonal allergies. Hay fever is what happens when individuals develop uh, an allergy to, typically it's gonna be tree pollens or different molds uh, that appear seasonally. And it's usually characterized by um, a runny nose, uh, congestion, uh, itching, sneezing, uh, that type of response. It's fairly easily treatable in most cases um, by over-the-counter medications, um, such as antihistamines that can sort of block the body's response to these particular, uh, these particular cytokines that are triggered in response to the exposure to the allergen. Another example is called atopic dermatitis, uh, also known as eczema. So this is what, uh, what happens when people either ingest, come in contact with, or inhale a particular antigen and actually causes their skin to break out. So they can get these red, itching, sort of weeping uh, uh, rashes that form. Then eventually they can actually scab over and form sort of like a tough, reddened area of the skin. Again, this is not a contagious condition. This is simply an allergy uh, that, uh, that they've developed uh, to something that's manifesting with a skin reaction. This can also, in uh, another example, a more serious example, uh, are food or drug allergies. So food allergies are actually quite prevalent and gaining prominence 
in, in lots of the developed world, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, reference the hygiene hypothesis. And one of the things we know about food allergies uh, is that typically people can, uh, people are most often triggered by these by ingesting their particular allergen, although in some cases they can react to skin contact as well uh, to their particular allergen. So the most common sources of food allergies are nuts such as peanuts or tree nuts, but these also include things like shellfish, uh, citrus fruits, uh, soy, and fish. Uh, however, the thing that needs to be noted is you can develop a food allergy to pretty much any type of food. These just happen to be the most common ones. Uh, for example, cow's milk is another very common, uh, a very common food allergy that, that is encountered. Uh, eggs too is also very common, particularly in very young children, although it's often outgrown. The thing to note is this, uh, food allergies can range in severity. Some people, when they're exposed to the particular allergen, will develop nothing more than an upset stomach and diarrhea, while as others will go into anaphylactic shock. An anaphylactic shock happens when you get a widespread systemic reaction to a particular allergen. So I can use my son or myself as an example. When I'm exposed to bee venom or my son is exposed to a peanut, what ends up happening is throughout his body, those IgE antibodies are bound. This triggers the release widely of mast cells. Uh, the, the mast cells begin to degranulate and you get this widespread inflammation. This is going to result in a massive amount of inflammation that then causes vasodilation throughout the body. It will also cause bronchoconstriction and the end result is, is the for development of something called anaphylactic shock which can, act, which can actually be fatal in a matter of minutes. The reason why is the blood vessels dilate which means you're getting a lack of perfusion. In other words, uh, the blood pressure is going to go into the tank. At the same time, so you're getting less oxygen circulating throughout your body. At the same time, the body is not able to, to respire because the bronchioles have now constricted, so there's no way to get oxygen in. This is the feeling of the throat closing up and, and, and the inability to breathe. The treatment for anaphylactic shock is uh, the most effective one is epinephrine. So most individuals, such as myself and my son, who have the potential to have an anaphylactic reaction in response to an allergen are required to carry not one but two EpiPens. And the reason why is that relief from an epinephrine boost is actually can only be is actually only temporary. And if the allergen is still present, we can go right back into anaphylactic shock should we be unable to make it to the hospital in time in which case we then take our second dose. The thing is this, if you witness somebody in anaphylactic shock or if you yourself are in anaphylactic shock, whether you receive an EpiPen uh, uh, dosage or not, the next step is going to the hospital because this skin reaction can, per can persist for hours after the initial exposure and you're going to want to seek medical treatment. Another way that an anaphylactic reaction can manifest is simply in the form of hives. So hives are that reddened rash all over the skin, also known as urticaria. What you're looking at when you see hives is what's called a wheel and flare reaction. The wheel is the size of the lump, whereas the flare is the redness that surrounds it. This wheel and flare reaction or hives is also a sign that somebody is having an anaphylactic reaction. They may not have the throat closing uh, and, the, um, and, and the, the hypoperfusion at this particular time, but it could be coming. And if somebody's having hives, especially a widespread hives reaction throughout their body, that is also someone that should seek immediate attention because they are having a system, a system wide response to a particular substance. The other thing to realize is that drug reactions can also vary in severity. So somewhere between five and 10% of the popular po population will react to any given drug. And again, the reactions can be ranged from uh, non-severe, such as a simple rash or itching or upset stomach, to anaphylaxis, which again is a severe response uh, to, a, to the exposure to an antigen, which can be fatal. So what do we do in response to individuals, particularly those that have severe one type one hypersensitivities? Well, the simplest solution for someone to, uh, to with that with a particular allergy, particularly one that could cause anaphylaxis, is to avoid their allergen. But that can be tricky. As anybody with a food allergy knows, it can be very hard to, to determine when and where your allergen might be present. Food labeling is helpful, but not all manufacturers label their food well. Uh, they're not required to by law to actually label them uh, with potential allergens. They're only required to list if there are allergens actually present in the food. So those of us who are allergy parents, particularly those with, uh, of children with food allergies, we get very good at reading packaging and also reading ingredients lists. The other thing that can be hard to avoid is if they go to somebody else's house or they go to the school cafeteria uh, where their allergen might be present. It's also not easy for me. I'm allergic to bees. I mean, my allergens are flying all around me every summer. So if I want to leave the house, I need to be aware that there's a potential for me to be exposed to my allergen. So while avoiding the allergy is best, it's not always the allergen is best. It's not always possible. 
another option uh, if someone is to another treatment option if you are exposed uh, so if it's a less severe allergic reaction you could be you could take things like antihistamines so people with seasonal allergies take antihistamines to block their body's reaction to those cytokines that are being released in response to exposure to their allergen in the case of anaphylactic shock it's going to be epinephrine you want to short circuit you want to short circuit that reaction so uh, epinephrine is the is another word for adrenaline and that's essentially what you do you override the bodies you override that vasodilation you override that bronchoconstriction by reversing it by essentially boosting your body into an adrenaline response which then expands the bronchioles and and constricts the, the vasculature to reverse the effects of that again that's only temporary until your body removes the adrenaline from the system and then one could potentially go right back into anaphylactic shock now there are some treatments that might actually prevent allergies the most effective one or what we call uh, allergy vaccines so these are you may have also heard them referred to as allergy shots and these have actually been found to be effective in about 70 percent of cases or at least reducing the severity of an individual's response to a particular allergen. Now, a new uh, a new therapy has emerged uh, recently, for particularly for those that allergic uh, that have food allergies, and this is what's called oral immunotherapy. So, or OIT. So, just recently, the FDA approved a new treatment for the individuals with a peanut allergy. And essentially, they take a pill with increasing amounts of peanut antigen inside of it. And what happens is, is in many cases, their body actually begins to build. Uh, a tolerance for that particular antigen. The thing to realize about that, is, it, a couple of things that need to be realized about this. First and foremost, it's not going to work for everyone. And we don't fully understand necessarily uh, how this happens. So what we do know is individuals who do receive some relief from this is their body goes from producing IgE antibodies against their allergen to IgG antibodies. How their body does this, we're not necessarily sure. We suspect that regulatory T cells are involved, but that's still uh, something that's under exploration. The other thing in particular with OIT is that it's not a permanent solution. One that is on OIT, as far as we know, will have to continue with OIT for the remainder of their life if they wish to, uh, if they wish to remain at least somewhat insensitive to their particular allergen. If they go off therapy, uh, early results suggest that within weeks or months, that individual will regain full sensitivity to their particular allergen. The last thing to talk about uh, is how do we monitor and how do we determine if someone has a type 1 hypersensitivity. Uh, quite often, the first hint that someone might have a type 1 hypersensitivity is they have a reaction. So if you have a severe reaction upon being ex being stung by a bee or ingesting some food or in the case of me getting stung uh, or in the case of hay fever, you know, you notice every spring you start to get teary eyed and, and runny nose and, you know, all the signs and symptoms of hay fever. How do we clinically diagnose this? Well, one of the most tried and true methods is the skin test. So you've probably seen this. Uh, you, you, uh, somebody goes in, uh, they basically get a little bit of uh, various allergens injected kind of under their skin, uh, and then they wait for a response, the wheel and flare reaction. This is a nice tried and true, fairly easy method to detect whether somebody's body mounts a full-blown um, immediate response to a particular antigen. Um, from there, they also often do blood monitoring. So they do something called a radiologic immunoabsorbent, uh, immunoabsorbent test or a RAST. Um, and what essentially happens here is you draw a patient's blood and you see um, how many, essentially how many antibodies or how strong, how many antibodies, IgE antibodies an individual has um, in response to a particular antigen. So it's just an immunologic test to see if their body has a large quantity of IgE antibodies against a particular antigen. It would seem to uh, indicate that that individual does, in fact, have a type 1 hypersensitivity to that particular allergen. If they have little to no IgE response, then they're someone who's not allergic to that particular antigen. So that brings us to type 2 hypersensitivities. And I know we talked a lot about type 1 hypersensitivities. There's a lot to unpackage there. The last three groups of, uh, last type, three types of hypersensitivities uh, don't have quite as much to them. Uh, they're a little bit more simplistic to understand. Type 2 hypersensitivities are those that are going to happen on the surface of a cell and lead to the lysis of that cell. Type 2 hypersensitivities are not going to involve IgE antibodies. Rather, they're going to involve IgM or IgG antibodies. And most commonly, the cells that are targeted are actually going to be red blood cells. The most common uh, examples of type 2 hypersensitivities are going to involve um, foreign blood products. So we'll talk about two different antigens commonly found on the surface of 
red blood cells. These are also what are known as alloantigens. Alloantigens are antigens that are present in some, but all not, not all members of a species. Two great examples of this are the ABO uh, blood antigens, as well as something called the RH or rhesus factor. So let's start with the ABO blood groupings. So A, B, and O uh, are antigens or carbohydrates that are found on the surface of some, but not all individuals' red blood cells. And what's, so uh, an individual could either produce one, type A or type B blood, or both, type AB blood. Now, if you are an individual who produces the A antigen, then you automatically produce antibodies against the B antigen. And if somebody, uh, if somehow type B blood makes it into your body, your antibodies will bind to and lead to the destruction of that type B blood. If you are an individual who has type B blood, you automatically produce antibodies against the A antigen and will attack type A blood if it enters into your system. If you are a B, that means you produce both antigens and produce neither antibodies. So in other words, if you're an individual who has AB blood, you can accept blood from a type A person, a type B person, a type AB person, or a type O person. Type O individuals, well, they produce none of the antigens, which means while they are the universal donor, they can only accept type O blood. The main reason for this is if any blood that has either the A, B, or AB antigens on the surface, well, those individuals will be targeted by the A, the anti-A and the anti-B antibodies that are being produced by that individual. So while you're the universal donor, you're a very specific acceptor. And while almost nobody wants AB blood uh, from an AB donor, except an AB individual, they can accept blood from pretty much anybody else. They're the universal acceptor. Now, the one thing to note is this. This interaction is mediated by IgM antibodies. And this is particularly important because if you recall, IgM antibodies are unable to cross the placental barrier, which means it doesn't matter whether mom is, a, is type A blood and her baby is type B blood because those antibodies can't float across the placental barrier and attack the baby's red blood cells. On the other hand, the rhesus factor is going to be mediated by a a IgG antibodies and IgG antibodies are ones that can cross the placental barrier. So what is the RH factor, also known as the rhesus factor? Well, 85% of individuals uh, of human beings are RH positive. In other words, they are A positive or B positive or O positive. The other 15% are negative. Those would be A negative, B negative, O negative, AB negative individuals. They do not produce the rhesus factor. Why is this important? Well, if somebody who is RH negative exposed is exposed to RH positive blood, they will develop a they will that will count as a sensitizing dose and they will begin producing anti RH antibodies. This is particularly important in the case of RH negative women who may become pregnant with an RH positive baby because if that baby does trigger an immune response in the mother, the mother will begin producing anti RH antibodies, which can then go across the placenta and begin destroying that baby's red blood cells. This leads to something called hemolytic disease of the newborn, a potentially fatal disease which can kill the fetus uh, due, to the, due to destroying all the majority of his red blood cells. To combat this, there is something called the Rogam shot. So most RH negative moms are given the Rogam shot. Rogam is essentially an anti antibody antibody. What that means is it's an antibody that specifically targets those RH, those anti-RH antibodies produced by mom. It's basically an antibody to absorb another antibody and prevent hemolytic disease of the newborn. Type 3 hypersensitivities are very analogous to type 2. It's still going to involve IgG and IgM antibodies. The difference is rather than binding to the surface of a cell leading to its destruction by other cells such as neutrophils or being targeted by complement, this is going to be in response to free floating antigen. So in other words, these IgG or IgM antibodies are going to bind to antigen that's in the bloodstream or in the body, causing it to precipitate and land on the basement membrane of various organs and blood vessels. As a result, it will appear that the cells of those blood vessels are actually being obstinized and labeled for destruction. And in response to that, uh, cellular uh, protein, proteinaceous responses such as complement as well as neutrophils and other cells in the tissue can actually come along and begin destroying uh, the, those tissues, which can lead to potentially organ failure or in the case of the Arthas reaction or serum sickness, uh, a pretty widespread allergic re uh, reaction essentially across the body. In the case of serum sickness, what ends up happening is 
Uh, a large amount of foreign antigen is introduced to the body. This could be in the form of an antitoxin that's being delivered to help a, a particular treatment. Um, what ends up happening is there's a, a huge quantity of this antigen uh, that gets injected into the body. The body amounts uh, a pretty pronounced antibody response, uh, and it's all in a very localized area. What can end up happening is uh, this individual will end up developing um, lots of, of damage to their vasculature, and it looks like a widespread rash uh, as the immune response is so strong and so pronounced. And what's, that, what's happening is the antibodies produced by the individual are binding to this particular antigen in such large quantities, these, um, these antibody antigen complexes are now falling out of suspension. They're precipitating and landing uh, in, in the blood vessels, causing those blood vessels to be damaged. So you actually get a little bit of uh, internal bleeding, uh, essentially, as a result of those blood vessels get damaged, as well as widespread inflammation. So you get the swelling as well. The Arthas reaction is actually what happens uh, often in response to uh, vaccines. So what can happen, uh, it's been documented, for, the, in the, for example, in the case of DTaP vaccines, so tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis vaccines that have been given too close together. Uh, what can end up happening is um, the body amounts a, a localized response, and you end up getting, again, these, these antigen antibody complexes falling out of suspension, uh, which can lead to complement or neutrophil-based uh, destruction uh, of the tissues uh, where, this, where these, where these antigen antibody complexes are precipitating. The last type of hypersensitivity is a type 4 hypersensitivity. And type 4 hypersensitivities don't involve B cells at all. So we're not going to be talking about antibodies. Instead, it's going to be T cell mediated. So what happens in type 4 hypersensitivities, which are also called delayed hypersensitivities, if you recall, when we have an infection and we built, we mount an immune response to something, we are going to have about 10% of those T cells that went to the tissue remain in residence as uh, resident tissue memory cells. Well, these are going to be involved in this particular reaction. So a, a great example of this is what happens with your PPD tests. So the PPD test is a test for tuberculosis. And what they do is they take a little bit of a substance called tuberculin, which are, is sort of a bunch of subunits from the tuberculosis bacterium. Otherwise, it's tuberculosis antigen, and they, and they inject it just below the skin. If you have been exposed to tuberculosis in the past, yeah, you've been infected with tuberculosis, you would have mounted a, a pretty pronounced immune response to it. In response to that, you would have helper T cells that have sort of remained in residence in the tissue. Well, what will happen over the next 24 to 48 hours is the dendritic cells in that tissue will actually present some of that antigen to those helper T cells uh, right at the spot of that injection. And over the next 24 to 48 hours, you will end up getting a, amount of, a certain amount of localized inflammation, which would indicate that, yes, there are memory T cells present in the tissue that are causing this particular, that are, that are responding to this particular antigen. The only reason those would be there is if you've been previously exposed to tuberculosis. That's why what they do is they measure the size of the lump in response to this. If you have no or very small amount of inflammation in response to this, it likely indicates that you have never been fully exposed to tuberculosis. However, if you have a pronounced swelling of that bump in response to that tuberculin, that would indicate that your body has an immunologic memory to tuberculosis. And that's where they do follow-up investigations to find out if you have, in fact, been exposed to tuberculosis. It's also why it explains why it's referred to as a delayed hypersensitivity. It takes 24 to 48 hours before it can happen. Uh, another great example of this is what happens when you're exposed to poison ivy or, or poison oak. Your body responds to a substance called ruchiol, which is the which is the oil that's produced by these plants that causes the allergic response. What ends up happening over the next 24 to 48 hours is you get this very pronounced reaction from those memory T cells. You get a full blown immune response, and this is what leads to the itching and the rash that occurs. Another example of this is what happens with organ transplants. So there is host versus graft and graft versus host disease. What ends up happening essentially is, in this case, the alloantigen in present in 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 question here is the major histocompatibility complex proteins, your MHCs. So if the MHCs aren't identical to the one that's in the individual receiving the graft or the new organ then what you can end up with is either the organ can attack the host, that is uh, graft versus host, or the host can attack the graft, and that's host versus graft disease. In other words, you get a rejection of the graft, which is potentially fatal, and at minimum warrants the removal of that particular uh, organ or that particular graft, if it's at all possible. This is a very bad situation, and in order to prevent this, this is why people who get an organ transplant or a graft 
uh, from an outside source typically have to undergo immunosuppressant therapy to delay the onset of this reaction. In the case of host versus graft, what ends up happening is the host's cytotoxic T cells uh, or, or CTLs or killer T cells, whatever you want to call them, begins to attack the graft because it doesn't recognize the MHCs on the surface and begins attacking those MHCs as though they were some type of foreign antigen. In graft versus host, occasionally when the organ or the tissue that's being transplanted, along with it comes uh, some killer T cells. And those killer T cells will actually begin attacking the host's cells, MHCs, triggering a rejection of that particular graft. The last thing I want to talk about today are autoimmunities. So autoimmunities are what happens when an individual's body attacks itself. In other words, the body mounts, a, mounts an immune response against itself. So uh, autoimmunities are somewhat common uh, throughout the world, and it's believed that there are actually three conditions that need to be met for an autoimmunity to develop. The first one is they have to produce uh, MHCs that are willing to present self-antigen. So if you recall, uh, most MHCs will not will not present self-antigen, at least MHC2 receptors won't. And the reason why is they're only supposed to present to T cells, they're only supposed to present um, uh, foreign antigen, things that are bound to their PRRs and so on and so forth. What we've found is that there are some individuals uh, that have different versions of the genes that encode their MHCs and they are more susceptible to autoimmunities. They also seem to be ones that have the ability to have MHCs that will present self-antigen when they're not supposed to. But there also has to be a failure of the tolerance inducing mechanism. So remember, we're not supposed to produce self-reactive T and B cells. They're supposed to be removed during that tolerance inducing process that occurs in either the thymus or the B cells. Now, as I said, it's possible because they can't show all potential antigens, self antigens to those B cells and T cells when they're being screened, that some of them may slip through. But a failure of the tolerance inducing mechanism may allow high numbers of, of self-reactive T cells or self-reactive B cells to enter into circulation in the body, which can then trigger the, um, the autoimmune response. The third thing is inflammation. Remember, it doesn't matter if you have self-reactive T cells and self-reactive B cells if the antibodies they produce can't make it to the part of the cell or if the T cells can't travel and make it into the tissues where they could react with their self-antigen. So those three criteria all appear to be necessary for autoimmunities to develop. Now, the other question is, how do auto autoimmunities appear? Some autoimmunities are inborn. People are born with them. Things like type 1 diabetes, for example, appear to be genetic. You are born a type 1 diabetic, hence the term juvenile diabetes, although we're sort of dispensing with that term as type 2 diabetes becomes more prevalent in children, unfortunately, throughout the developing world. Although, But many autoimmunities actually develop later on in life. And the reason for this, at least the hypothesis that is, that is most commonly used to explain this is something called molecular mimicry. So the thing to remember is this, T cells and B cells each had their unique wonderful T cell receptor or B cell receptor that recognizes specifically their cognate antigen. But that's a bit of a misnomer. And the reason why is recall that those TCRs and those BCRs specifically react to a portion of their cognate antigen called the epitope. Now that epitope is definitely present on their cognate antigen, but it could be present on many other antigens as well. And their affinity for it may be more or less strong depending on how well it matches their T cell receptor or their B cell receptor. So what could theoretically happen, and this stems from an observation that many people develop an autoimmunity following an infection. So this is what molecular mimicry, uh, this is how molecular mimicry uh, hypothetically works. An individual may have T cells and or B cells that could respond to self antigen, but for the most part, they will never be activated. And the main reason why is they'll never have a dendritic cell that will show up and say, Hey, this thing is a problem, or those things will never get labeled with complement. So they won't stick to the FTC and present to the B cells. Hey, this is, uh, this is kind of a problem. We need to fight it off. But let's say that a pathogen shows up and causes an infection. And as part of that pathogen, there is some antigen that has that self epitope or something that closely resembles, mimics that epitope that could mount, a, that would resemble in a response to a self antigen. 
Now, all of a sudden, you will have dendritic cells that will present that antigen because it's of a foreign source. Now, you will have complement opsonize the antigen because it is from a foreign source. And as a response, you will get those self-reactive T cells and self-reactive B cells to begin mounting an immune response. Now, this is good and healthy and important during that particular infection. But the problem is this. Following that infection, you are now going to have an immunologic memory. You will have resident memory T cells, tissue resident memory T cells. You will have central memory T cells. You will have uh, long-lived plasma B cells secreting those autoantibodies. And the problem is this, that immune response will now never go away because remember how much easier it is to activate memory T cells and memory B cells. The body has already validated that that particular antigen is in fact a problem. And now you in some cases have antibodies, in most cases have T cells that will respond to that particular antigen, even though it's on the surface of one of your own cells. And now you've developed a full blown autoimmunity. So molecular mimicry is believed to be the way that many of these autoimmunities are acquired throughout life. And one of the things they've begun to, to investigate is which particular autoimmunities could be triggered by which particular particular infections. For example, the Epstein-Barr virus, which can cause mononucleosis, has been implicated as having several different antigens that may actually lead to autoimmune diseases such as, uh, such as MS. So let's talk about some of the more common autoimmunities that we may encounter. The first one is called systemic lupus erythematosus, also known just simply as lupus. So lupus affects about 250,000 people in the United States. 90% of them are women, uh, which is particularly interesting. Now, this is actually a type 3 hypersensitivity. And what happens is these individuals produce autoantibodies that target um, uh, nuclear antigens. In other words, they target material that's found in the nucleus of our cells. These antibodies can then target uh, lots of different circulating uh, blood cells. They quite often target white blood cells as well as red, red, red blood cells, but they can also target clotting factors and they can also target uh, uh, platelets as well. The end result is these blood cells and these blood products begin to fall out of suspension and they begin to cause damage in many of the internal organs with a special focus on the kidneys. Common signs and symptoms of this, uh, the most common one is, is actually uh, something called the butterfly rash. So it actually extends over the bridge of the nose and across the cheeks. Um, and the problem is treatment for this, there is really no cure for lupus and the treatments that are utilized are mainly focused on preventing the damage to the organs as a result of this type three hypersensitivity. The next two autoimmunities target the thyroid. So the first one's called Graves' disease. So with Graves' disease, there's going to be autoantibodies that are actually gonna target uh, the thyroid uh, hormone stimulating receptor. Uh, so what ends up happening is, is these individuals are stimulated to reduce, release uh, a bunch of thyroid hormone. And the end result is, uh, is, is going to be sort of a boost in energy as well as a boost in metabolic rate. This is also going to cause the thyroid to swell and form a goiter. Uh, this is also known as hyperthyroidism. The next one is called Hashimoto's. So Hashimoto's is a condition in which autoantibodies target the cells of the thyroid follicle. And as a result, the thyroid follicle uh, slowly begins to atrophy, it begins to die off. Uh, initially, there is a swelling uh, or to form a goiter, and then eventually there is the atrophy, which leads to a, a shrinking of the thyroid. Uh, the problem is, is individuals that have this do not release thyroid hormone, and as a result, they end up with hypothyroidism, and, uh, and over time, they, get, they show fatigue and, and weight gain and a decrease in metabolic output. Myasthenia gravis is another autoimmune disease that's characterized by autoantibodies. In this case, autoantibodies are produced against the acetylcholine receptor on the surface of muscle cells. And as a result, those muscle cells uh, over time are unable to respond to acetylcholine, which prevents muscle contraction. Uh, the earliest signs and symptoms of this are, are something called eye droop um, and then descending paralysis. So eye droop uh, happens because the muscles uh, that control the eyes are actually fairly weak. Uh, over time, they begin to sort of atrophy and fail. Um, and then, then you get this paralysis eventually to face and inability to swallow and, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is actually a, a, a type 2 hypersensitivity in which cells are actually being destroyed because of those autoantibodies. Type 1 diabetes is actually a T cell mediated autoimmunity that affects about 1.25 million Americans. Uh, what happens in this case uh, is 
uh, individuals produce self-reactive killer T-cells. And those killer T-cells specifically target the pancreatic beta cells, which are who, whose responsibility is to produce insulin. Uh, this is also known as the silent killer because by the time it's discovered, quite often greater than 90% of the pancreatic beta cells have actually been destroyed. These are insulin-dependent diabetics that often have to have some uh, have an insulin pump or take insulin therapy throughout life because their body is going to lose the ability to produce insulin, which is fatal if left untreated. One of the things we know about this is there is a strong genetic component linked to it. So if you uh, have a sibling that has type 1 diabetes, chances are you were tested very early in life to make sure that you don't have type 1 diabetes. It does seem to be at least a familial link with respect to type 1 diabetes. So kind of like we saw with um, type 1 hypersensitivities, if you have a close relative who is a type 1 diabetic, uh, chances are you and, and the other close relations are going to be tested just to ensure that you don't have type 1 diabetes and that if you do, that it can be treated before there are severe complications associated with it. The last one we'll talk about is rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis can either be a type 2, a type 3, or a type 4 hypersensitivity, depending on the mechanism. Uh, in some cases, you are going to have uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes or killer T cells that can actually damage uh, the material in the joints, the cartilage uh, in the joints, and that can lead to inflammation and then uh, the, the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. In other cases, it's a type 3 where you end up getting these antibody antigen complexes that form uh, that then begin to uh, come out of suspension. They precipitate in the joints, and this leads to uh, phagocytes and other cells uh, causing massive amounts of inflammation and damage to the joints that actually triggers the arthritis. Um, most treatments around that uh, are going to be ones that sort of uh, are going to be ones that sort of tamp down the immune response uh, with the hope of relieving um, with of relieving the the inflammation that's causing the arthritis in the first place. So that wraps up our two video series on diseases of the immune system. In the first one, we talked about immunodeficiencies or what happens when the immune system fails to respond appropriately. And in this one, we talked about hypersensitivities, which happens when an immune system reacts too strongly and sometimes, in the cases of autoimmunities, responds too strongly to itself. So I hope you guys learned a lot from these two videos. I look forward to talking to you guys soon. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bye.